This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 15th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, two from the top 20% argue, don't tax me, don't tax my industry, tax middle and lower income Alaska families instead. Our reaction. Second, oil prices are stabilizing and Conoco is restoring ANS production. What does that mean for Alaska's finances? And third, even the news miner is calling for reduced spending. What we think that means. And now let's join Michael. Let's talk about the top three. The first one is uh, is it's all about the tax. Uh, we're talking about oil production taxes, and uh, you know the top twenty percent saying, "Don't tax me, don't tax my industry." What does that leave us? Uh, give us your perspective on this. Well, there's an editorial running in in papers throughout the state. It made the Anchorage Daily News yesterday. It's been in the Journal of Commerce and and the News Miner and the and the Empire uh, before yesterday. It's a it's a co-authored. Um, uh, editorial from Jim, Jam- Jim Jansen, who's chairman of the Linden Companies, and Joe Sharahorn, who is president of and CEO of Northrum Bank. Um, and it's basically uh, a piece that you would expect, uh, given the fact that we've got an oil tax referendum on the ballot uh, in November. It's a, it's a piece that talks about uh, uh, the, the need to avoid uh, increases in oil taxes, the impact of increased oil taxes on North Slope development, the, the negative impact on jobs, the negative impact on long-term state revenues. Um, and, it's, and it's sort of the, the usual piece you would expect uh, around that issue. Uh, but I took it, I, I read it in a much different way, and really uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of the continuation of the outrage I had last week uh, with the Ed Rasmussen uh, editorial. It, it is the top 20% telling the rest of Alaskans, basically, don't tax the oil industry. Jansen and Shearhorn have previously written editorials uh, and, and participated in projects uh, designed to push costs, uh, to, 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 to force costs to be, state costs to be borne through PFD cuts. Um, it pushed the cost down to middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, through PFD cuts, so so they've they've said don't tax the top 20 percent, push those costs to middle and lower income Alaska families. Now this editorial says don't tax the oil industry, um, and and it and it and the cumul- cumulative effect of that is really beginning to 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 bother me. I mean it's the same thing we're hearing from the one Alaska uh, uh, project, which is the 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 project to push back against uh, the oil tax referendum. They're running these ads that have business people saying, you know, it's not a time to tax uh, tax the oil industry. Uh, it's not a time to tax my industry. These are people who run, you know, oil service, oil field service industries or, or project or companies, or, you know, in one case, the Matsu, Mat- Matanuska who sit in a brewery. I think is 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 another one of those ads. Don't tax, don't tax me, don't tax the oil industry. Um, so who does that leave? I mean, Jansen and Sherhorn also have talked in the past about the need to maintain state spending, the importance of the university system, the importance of of maintaining you know spending on K through 12, the importance of of maintaining a, 
uh, the various so various social network uh, uh, systems uh, that, the st that the state provides, sort of like Rasmussen. So they don't want to cut state spending significantly. They don't want to tax. They don't want tax themselves uh, to pay for. Uh, uh, state spending, right? Uh, because they want to push it down to PFD cuts, and they don't want to tax the oil industry. Who, who's that? Who, who does that leave? And is and and I go back to the old Earl Long, Russell Long, excuse me, Earl Long was his uh, was his uncle, Russell Long, Senate, former senator from Louisiana, longtime Senate Finance U.S. Senate Finance Committee chairman, who, when asked once to sum up, you know, what what testimony they get. Uh, in front of the Senate Finance Committee when they're considering taxes, Russell had this great saying. He said it was, don't tax me, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax that guy behind the tree. Right, right. And 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 that's exactly what's going on here. Jansen and Shearhorn are saying, or have previously said, don't tax me, don't don't have income taxes uh, uh, or, t or tax structures that reach, uh, uh, reach the top 20%, take that money out of the PFD, cut the PFD, don't, and now they're saying don't tax industry, um, uh, and and so okay that takes that takes in their view that takes industry out. Somebody's got to pay these bills. Somebody's got to pay the billion and a half deficit uh, that we're that we're facing uh, uh, over the next ten, per year over the next ten years. And and their basic their basic approach is tax that guy behind the tree. Right. Tax middle and lower income Alaska families, and that's you know to me I'm I'm a I'm I I oppose the oil initiative on on the grounds that I think it is essentially a tax on on future Alaska future Alaskans uh, by reducing incentives to, to drill and develop and reducing future revenues, uh, but but this argument that that both Jansen and Shearhorn. And and one Alaska is putting out there of don't tax me, don't tax, don't tax you, don't tax me. That that may be the one argument that would push me over to support the oil tax initiative, because it's because it's basically saying give give us all a break, give the top twenty percent a break, give the oil and gas industry a break, but tax, but this, and so that only leaves. That only leaves middle and lower income Alaska families through through cutting the PFD. Do, do you think? And, and I just, and I and I just find that hypocritical and uh, and disingenuous and uh, and 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 really disappointing. Do you think in their messaging they should be offering an alternative? I mean, would that make you more satisfied? I mean, are they? Uh, I mean, because they're basically saying don't tax. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I've seen the ads. I've watched the ads on. You know, they're everywhere, uh, social media and and everything else. Uh, do you do you think that uh, you know the, the, if they offered some kind of alternative, uh, are they are they should they be required to do that or is it just I mean because what I'm hearing out of this is don't tax the the industry because it's going to hurt Alaskan jobs it's going to you know create even more financial crunch uh, should they be offering the, this kind of other alternative for where the money comes from then Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if if I were if I were Shearhorn and and Jansen, what I would say is look. This burden, this spending burden, is Alaskans. We need, we as Alaskans, need to step up and pay for our government. We need to be smart about what we're doing with industry. We don't need to hurt the industry. We don't need to hurt future. Take money out of future Alaskans by by taking money out of the industry now and reducing investment, reducing investment going forward and reducing revenues going forward. We Alaskans need to pay for our government. That's that's the message that I think would resonate at least with me but but instead of doing that instead of saying this burden ought to be ought to be borne by all alaskans not by the industry all current alaskans who are getting the benefit of all this not by the industry instead of saying that what they're saying is yeah this burden you know that ought to be really borne by middle and lower income alaska families instead of all alaskans we the top 20 percent we need to be exempted from it by 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 recovering these costs through middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, so they're not saying all Alaskans should pay for government. We Alaskans should pay for government. What they're essentially saying is is some of us should pay for government. Some of us should get away should should get off with not having to pay for government, um, and we ought to let the industry off the hook too. If if, if Jansen and 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 Chairhorn stepped up and say all Alaskans, including us, and 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 took it on themselves to say including us, ought to pay a share 
uh, an equitable share of, of the burden of government of the, uh, ought to cover this deficit, this shortfall equitably through all of us. Uh, I think that would be a great message, but but that's certainly not what they're doing. Well, and it definitely would be a message that probably Alaskans aren't ready to hear. I mean, based on the reaction that we get here on the program from the things that you say uh, to, you know, mostly a conservative audience here, people are not ready to, you know, people are, are uh, they get upset by that. And I, and I understand why they're trying to avoid that in the messaging, uh, because Alaskans, you know, even though conservatives have been screaming for smaller government, the last thing you want to hear is, well, now you're going to be burdened with all this stuff that you've been fighting against anyway, uh, and so it's up, it's on you. And and I think that is, it's a hard truth, I guess, is what I'm saying. It, it is a hard truth, but but the, but the harder truth is the harder truth is what what's really going on here is the top twenty percent are trying to exempt themselves from 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 bearing part of the burden. They're now trying to exempt the industry from bearing part of the burden. And where does that burden go? Yeah, That burden goes to middle- and lower-income Alaska families. And, yeah, we can say, oh, you know, we ought to, we ought to cut spending so, so there's no burden on anybody. But that's not happening. There isn't right. a political will uh, to make those spending cuts. So somebody's going to have to pay it. Somebody's going to have to pay that billion and a half uh, uh, deficit per year that's sitting out there uh, in the 2020s. Um, and and there's there's no place else to go. It either goes it either goes to the industry. It either goes to all to to all Alaskans, including the top twenty percent, or through PFD cuts. It's going to middle and lower income Alaska families. May not may not be may not be what uh, what uh, uh, some Alaskans want to hear. Certainly isn't what the top twenty percent wants to hear. Uh, that they would have to pay for part of government. But but the hypocrisy of pushing it this way, the hypocrisy of Jansen and Shearhorn. Uh, over the last uh, over the last few years, saying uh, don't tax us uh, uh, and 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 tax the middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. Don't tax us, tax middle and lower income Alaska families. And now, when there's there's a proposal to to raise some more from the industry, saying well, don't tax the industry either. I mean, the hypocrisy of that is just is just overwhelming. Right. David said first of all, he said. Uh, there's no way for Alaska to tax its way to fiscal sanity, is what he said at the beginning. And then he said, even if you tax the top 20% to the max, you would not come close to closing the budget gap. Those are kind of his part of his two comments on there, and I wanted you to be able to respond to that. We already are taxing ourselves. That's what PFD cuts are. It's a diversion of, of income that's intended for the private sector to the government. That's the classic economic definition of a tax. The question is: the question is, who bears the tax? And right now, it's being borne largely by middle and lower income Alaska families. When we talk about the top 20 percent, when I talk about the top 20 percent uh, paying taxes, I'm talking about them paying an equitable share of that, not not taxes on top of that, but an equitable share of what's already being taxed. Right now, the lower the the, the top 20 percent are paying less than two percent. Uh, of their adjusted gross income uh, in, in terms of uh, they're losing that in terms of PFD cuts. The lowest 20 percent are paying more than 20 percent of their income in terms of in terms of lost revenue as a result of PFD cuts. If you if you even that out so that all Alaska families uh, bore the same brunt uh, of of that tax of the PFD tax uh, or the revenues being raised by the PFD tax. Everybody would contribute 3.5 percent. So I'm not talking about the top 20 percent paying all of it, but I'm certainly not talking about what's happened. But I'm certainly talking about something different than what's happening now, which is middle and lower income Alaska families are currently paying uh, almost all of it. So every, in my view, everybody ought to pay. Everybody ought to pay the same percent. A flat tax across the board, not a progressive Shit. income tax, but not the not the mirror image, which is PFD cuts, which is a regressive. Uh, income tax that hits middle and lower income Alaska families. So you're, it, it is, I was just going to say your assertion is that 3.5 percent across the board would close that gap. It would raise the same revenue as as PFD cuts uh, in this last uh, in this last go round um, as as the level of PFD cuts in 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 the FY21 budget. Uh, if if we are trying to close the full billion five gap then that number has to be higher. But it's higher for all Alaska families. I'm not saying raise the difference through 
uh, a, a, some sort of special tax on the top 20%. I'm saying raise it for the same for all Alaska families. What what many are proposing to do is closing that 1.5 billion budget, uh, 1.5 billion dollar uh, uh, gap by just eliminating the PFD, which is essentially doubling the tax on middle and lower income Alaska families, just taking even more out of middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. What I'm saying is if we've got a we've got a budget gap, it needs to be closed by all Alaskans on an equitable basis, equitable basis as opposed to what we're doing now, which is just shoving it down to middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, he also asked about overpaid government unions. Don't they really benefit from the overspending? Um, I, I think that's kind of a no-brainer, but I mean, it's not something we can necessarily control, right? Sure. There's, there's a, I mean, Michael, you and I, since 2013, if not before, have been talking about places that we can make cuts. We've been talking about cuts to the university, consolidating the university system. We've been talking about making cuts to, uh, uh, to, to you know, government employees, to government, to, to government employee salaries. We've been talking about places you can make cuts, and and there, those places can, uh, can can be made. They're still there. Technically, they're still there, but there's not the political will uh, to, uh, to to do that. When Governor Dunleavy tried to cut a billion dollars out of the budget, he couldn't even get 16 legislators to back him up on 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 upholding uh, a veto that would have that would have taken that that billion dollars out he got 16 legislators at significantly lower amounts of cuts but he couldn't get 16 to back him up on that on that billion dollars of cuts so yeah there's all sorts of places that 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 we can make cuts but there's not the political will uh, there has not been the political will to make those cuts. And since 2016, middle and lower income Alaska families have been paying a tax to pay for that for that increased spending. So it's uh, for that for that ongoing spending. So, yeah, there's places you can make cuts, but we haven't made them. And we've been taxing middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for it. It's time that 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 burden be spread equitably across all of all Alaska families and not just middle and lower income Alaska families. And your assertion here in less than 40 seconds, your assertion would be that if we did that, that Alaskans would more have more skin in the game. This is at all like Hamill, Hamill, uh, uh, ha- um, Hammond had his point that they would have more skin in the game, would probably call a screeching halt to the size and scope of government. Exactly. That's And when we get to the Fairbanks uh, News Minor editorial, that's going to be my point with that. We finally hit the point where people are pushing back. That's because they have to pay. Rod yeah. Boyce probably got his property tax bill. That's probably why we got that editorial. <laughs> finally, we're, okay. we're finally getting people to have to pay. Well, uh, I want to move on here to number two. In the in the in the speaking of expediency, let's uh, let's see if we can get on to number two. So that was number one. Uh, uh, we should uh, move on over here. Prices have now stabilized in the oil market, and Conoco is actually coming back and saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna increase production." What does that mean for us? Well, that's a good thing. Uh, prices have we're we're, we're back uh, uh, running at about thirty dollars, uh, thirty five dollars, forty dollars on some days, depending upon the futures market uh, uh, on uh, on on oil prices. So that's that's a that's a positive. We're back from the, you know, from the teens and the and the, or the twenties and the teens and the and for one day, uh, sub zero. Uh, Conoco during all of that. Uh, during all of the market dislocations created by the drop in demand, uh, in uh, in May announced that they were going to reduce their production by half. It was part of a of a worldwide global reduction by Conoco uh, in various places, but said they were going to reduce A and S production uh, by half, and they've done that in June. Uh, rather than run in the high 400,000 barrels a day as we had through most of the year. Uh, we've been running in the high 300,000 barrels a day. Uh, production's been down by about 20% uh, in June. Um, and and Conoco's cut back on shipments. They've got one shipment that they sent off to, to – one shipment of oil, one, one tanker of oil they sent off to China. Uh, they've had one tanker sitting in uh, a port in uh, Washington State for 40 days, uh, not moving, not doing anything. So they've, they've – in various ways, they've cut back uh, – Cut back on production and deliveries. Uh, the market has uh, generally has, as I said, has stabilized around the the thirty-five to forty-dollar range. 
Uh, and Conoco has now announced that, that they're going to come back up with 100, 000, that 100,000 barrels a day they cut, bring it back on uh, for July. So at the beginning of the new fiscal year, which we'll have on July 1, uh, we'll be back up in the high uh, 400,000 uh, of production again uh, in the $40 range. What does that mean for Alaska now that oil prices have stabilized and uh, Conoco is restoring some of its lost production? Where does that uh, take us and what does it mean for Alaska? It means, Michael, that we're back to where we were with the spring revenue forecast and with the discussion we were having about the about the tenure tenure projections, the FY twenty one budget and the tenure projections uh, at the time that that uh, the legislature uh, left uh, Juneau. The the spring forecast uh, forecast a thirty seven dollar average thirty seven dollar a barrel uh, uh, price for uh, FY twenty one. That's what the FY21 budget is based on. And now if you look at the, at the future strip, uh, we're about at a $40 or so uh, barrel average over, um, uh, over FY21. So we're back in the range uh, of where we were uh, when we left. And that $41 uh, uh, price, $40, $40 price, uh, uh, projected price on the futures market, uh, is would be was in the FY21 budget applied to uh, a r- roughly uh, high 400s, near 500,000 barrel a day production. If Con- with Conoco reversing its uh, its cuts uh, and bringing that production back on, we're around uh, uh, that that number again, the projection number that was used in the uh, FY21 budget. So revenues. This, this, the, 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 the stabilizing of the market of the, of the oil price market and Conoco bringing those production, uh, bringing that production back on, puts us back to where we were in March uh, when we were, uh, when we were forecasting uh, what the FY21 budget and what the 2020s generally were going to look like. But remember, <laughs> that was not a good place to be. I mean, that for, that's that's the forecast that has a billion and a half dollar deficit. Uh, every year, uh, uh, plus or minus a billion and a dollar and a half deficit every year uh, for the next ten years. Uh, that's a that's a horrible place for the state to be in with that with that sort of fiscal gap. So we 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 we've, we've sort of bounced back from the from the depths of some of the projections that were being made when we were down in the teens and the twenties, uh, and particularly the projections that were made when we were down in the teens and the twenties. And Conoco had cut a hundred thousand barrels a day out. Uh, we're back from 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 what we're what we're in excess of two billion dollars, uh, higher higher than two billion dollars of deficits at, at those numbers. We're back to to where we were before, which is a billion and a half. I would say that Conoco's uh, Conoco's announcement, where they announced they were restoring production, uh, they also said that we, they were not uh, at the same time announcing that they were going to restart their drilling program. Uh, that you'll recall got put in abeyance uh, when we went into COVID, when they got con- when there were concerns about uh, uh, COVID. So um, COVID spreading onto the onto the slope. So there was so it, there's mostly immediate in the immediate term. There's good news in terms of that hundred thousand uh, barrels coming back, but from a longer term perspective, we haven't seen the additional news uh, that we want to see in terms of increased drilling and. And, and a restart to the exploration program that they had planned for uh, 2020. They've, they've, they've not said they're going to restart that exploration program in 2021. So the long and the short of it is we're kind of back where we started, uh, which was not necessarily a great place to begin with. Exactly right. We're out of the depths of the, of the worst days that we were in uh, with, uh, with the COVID depression, but we're uh, – uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't that doesn't mean we're out of out of the hole by any stretch of the imagination. We're in the hole we were in, uh, in the very same hole we were in in March. All right. Well, that brings us on to number three, which was, of course, the discussion that we started the hour off with, with this opinion piece in the Fairbanks Daily News Miner. Which I mean, I said that for as long as I've been reading the News Miner and commenting on it, they never saw a a government a cut to government that they didn't want to excoriate and point you know tell you exactly how wrong you were and yet ironically enough this piece comes out and embraces fiscal conservatism and in fact says that this is what we need moving forward even when things get rosier again we hope that this is what we need uh which i mean this this article looks like it was written by somebody who has never worked at the news miner before 
Well, I think Rod's still writing the uh, writing the editorial, so he's been there for a long time. There's there's one thing about the about the headline that uh, that's important here. It says a new outlook on taxpayer funds. These difficult times might instill a greater local fiscal conservatism. They're not yet admitting that there ought to be conservative fiscal conservatism at the state level, particularly when it comes to the university, which is one of the pet projects of the news miner. But uh, it, at least they're they're expressing that it ought to be uh, a greater local fiscal conservatism. Here's here's my take from that editorial, and I agree it's it's out of step with what I've seen from the news miner over the years. It's a it's an interesting step, but but here's here's what I think is going on. I think. They, that, that in Fairbanks, we are seeing uh, taxpayer pushback, uh, broader scale taxpayer push, pushback. I mean, if the news miners picking up on it, I think it's I think it's become broader scale. Um, and 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 people who have to pay taxes are saying, no, we we want a limit to, 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 to how we're paying these taxes, or how much we're paying in these taxes. And uh, that is 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 pushing through to. You know, push back on 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 local budgets. The thing about it is, in in Fairbanks, I mean, it, Fairbanks has property taxes like everybody else does, the, the, and, and the borough has property taxes. The, the the thing is, that pushback is coming because taxes are broad based, right? Right. Everybody's feeling them. They're not being they're not being shunted off. The tax burden isn't being shunted off to just one small segment uh, or one you know uh, uh, smaller segment of the of of the borough population, it is a broad scale tax, and I think I think what this is demonstrating is when everybody has to pay taxes, then everybody gets involved in the game of pushing back and saying, "Wait, you're spending too much. Our tax burden's too great. We have to get a balance here between between what we're spending and uh, and, and 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 you know what we're what we can afford to pay or what we're willing to pay uh, uh, to government." At the state, we don't have that at the state level. At the state level, by using PFD cuts, we've shoved the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20% aren't feeling any significant share uh, of the burden. And so you're not getting that broad scale pushback um, at the state level. And, and in my view, you won't get that broad scale pushback at the state level until all Alaska families have skin in the game, until they're all dealing with uh, the consequences of, um, of 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 high tax burdens to to pay for high state high state spending, then you might get all Alaska families, including the top twenty percent, complaining about David's favorite subject, complaining about union wages. But until we have that, and until we see, you know, sort of in, until we have that burden spread broadly, so that all Alaska families have skin in the game, I don't. You're you're not going to see that same sort of pushback. I think. I think the Fairbanks editorial is is great news. It's a great indication of what happens when when the the taxpayer burden gets too great and people start pushing back. But that only happens when the taxpayer taxpayer burden is broadly is broadly felt, um, and all taxpayers are uh, are uh, are at risk of of having to bear the burden of increased government spending. So again, you think this is more again a local issue and. Uh... We should not be, you know, we should not be looking for them to do auditorials on how the state should be cutting back their money, uh, either. Here, about ninety seconds. No, I, 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 I don't think there's an immediate leap to that. I mean, we've seen the news miner editorial in the past saying that government spending ought to be paid for through PFD cuts, that we ought to continue spending on the university, that we ought not to be cutting back through K through twelve, um, and and frankly, it's because, in my view, it's because we don't have we don't have a broad scale taxpayer rebellion. Uh, uh, working at the state level yet, because we've not spread the tax burden uh, throughout throughout all the state. If we do that, if we spread it to include the 20 percent, I expect to see editorials like this saying the tax burden is not is it has become too great. But until we do that, until we until all Alaskans have skin in the game, I think we're going to continue to see the top 20 percent and editorials. Um, uh, when they focus on the state level being, you know, continue spending, don't cut, uh, uh, keep cutting the PFD, that's the way to go. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I mean, I was just hoping maybe that somebody had taken over over there and that we were going to see some some real change, but maybe it's just, uh, like you said, taking the temperature in the room and understanding where 
your constituency is going. Maybe Rod's playing into that, or maybe he just got his tax bill and realized that uh, he's feeling a little bit of a pinch. So I'm with you on that. You could have knocked me over with a feather when I read that uh, when I read that opinion piece because I was just like, this just does not sound like the folks that have been running this joint for years and years and years. Uh, but uh, pretty uh, pretty ironic. And and again, you could see that you could see this feeling of the top twenty percent. Uh, in many different ways. I think the most recent one, and I don't know if you caught this, Brad, but there's an article about how the University of Alaska faculty union is now calling for the resignation of Jim Johnson. Uh, you know, this is after the couple votes of no confidence and everything else. He was going to go to the University of Wisconsin, and then he withdrew because there was all kinds of hullabaloo and outrage that, you know, you should bring a president of one failing university in to run your university and all this kind of stuff. But uh, the money quote for me was near the near the end of the article and it was a quote about uh where uh, one of the people who one of the people from the faculty who were just you know uh, uh lambasting johnson said that his responses last week to questions during the interview with the university of wisconsin uh were just crazy including this one for example johnson characterized alaskans as prioritizing handouts from the government in the yearly pfd payment and not taking care of the state which I think pretty much says it all about kind of the mindset of many of these folks, both left and right, progressive or conservative, is that they see this as a handout from government in this yearly PFD payment instead of what it is. And, and I mean, that's really part of the problem, right? It is It is part of the problem, Michael. I mean, I, I understand that John Coghill used the term unearned income in a debate that he was having with Rob Myers uh, this past weekend up, uh, up in the uh, North Pole. And, and Coghill said, well, the PFD is just uner- unearned income, and that is, it's okay to, to cut that. Well, wait a second. It, it, trust fund income to Natasha von Imhoff, by the way, trust fund income and royalties are treated as unearned income also. But, what's the, but we, we're not cutting those and we're not taxing those. What's the difference? It's the, that's unearned income to the top 20 percent, the trust fund babies. And, and those who have royalties down from oil production down in Texas and Louisiana and elsewhere. They don't want that cut. But, this, but the very same thing, what Governor Hammond set up, essentially a trust for Alaskans that, that benefit middle and lower income Alaskans, the, the, trust fund, the income from the trust fund for Alaskans uh, uh, in terms of PFDs and the royalty to, to Alaska landowners in, in, in terms of in terms of, uh, of the, the citizens of the state, that's okay to cut. That, that sort of unearned income, in, unearned income is bad, and we can cut that. But unearned income to the top 20%, oh, no. The very same type of unearned income, income to the top 20%, oh, no, don't tax that. Don't cut that. That's, 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 that's good. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, this, it's this continuing it's this continuing belief that somehow – the, the PFD income, which is, which is trust fund income created by Governor Hammond to go to the benefit of all Alaska families, that that's somehow you know, unearned and, and un, unintended and, and windfall income uh, that, that that's, that's justifiably, can justifiably be cut. But, but the exact same type of income when it goes to the top 20% from their private trust funds and from their private royalty trusts, that, that sort of, that sort of, that's good. You know, we don't want to touch that. I, it, it's this, it's this, 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 this sense that, that the PFD, at the, at the end of the day, is government money, and the government can do with it whatever it wants. Government's the stockbroker. It, it can divert the income intended for Alaska families. It can divert the income to government, and that's okay. I, I, it's just, it's just mind boggling to me the hypocrisy involved in how the top 20% you know, rationalize their way to, to not taxing them and rationalize their way to uh, taxing middle and lower income Alaska families. That, that, that bothers me. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the thing. I mean, this unearned income, uh, but because it doesn't, didn't come from, you know, daddy or granddaddy or some other kind of royalty or something else, then it's okay to take. And again, I think that just plays right back into the fact that they all believe that this is some form of welfare and government handout instead of, as you put it, a trust uh, in, in Alaskan, you know, for for, Ala- for the Alaskan people. Uh, and, and I guess what really irritates me about this whole thing, Brad, and I'm not going to break it all down again, but, uh, you know, the permanent fund and the permanent fund earnings, I mean, this is a fraction of a fraction of the money that is earned 
uh, in the state of Alaska that the state receives from these oil royalties and this wealth. Um, and, and it's like they want, you know, it's like the, here's the whole cake and we took one little slice and the state got the rest of it and, you know, they want to take the slice and leave us with nothing but crumbs at the end. And in fact, they want to take their little finger and wet it and pick up all the crumbs as well. So it's like they don't want to leave you with anything. They want it all. It's They want to consume everything in the room and then some. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, G- Governor Hammond set up a system to let Alaskans share in, in a small portion, you're exactly right, a small portion of the wealth from production in the state in terms of in term, in term of trust revenue or in terms of in terms of royalty revenue, however you want to categorize it. And and his view was that all Alaskans, I mean, since since the, the wealth was transferred to the state, uh, uh, essentially for the benefit of Alaska citizens, that the, the, his his view was a portion of that ought to be transferred directly to Alaska citizens. Um, what the top 20 percent is saying basically is, oh, no, that ought to go to our benefit. Because what we ought to do is we we shouldn't have to pay any tax, and this and this benefit that's been going to l- middle and lower income Alaska families ought to be used to pay for government instead of taxing us. So we ought to get away tax free uh, uh, in this deal. Middle and lower income Alaska families, because they've been getting income from this particular category, they ought to, they ought to pay the burden. And I, it's just we're all in this together. All of us are in this together. All of us ought to be pushing back on government costs together. We're not. The top 20% aren't spending any of their political capital right. to push back on cutting. They'll give lip service to it, but they're yeah. not spending any of their political capital to cut spending because it doesn't impact them because right. they've managed to manipulate the costs over to middle and lower income Alaska families. Absolutely. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.